What are you gonna make? David Simon's modern classic, The Wire, one of the best TV shows ever made, plays on the meaning of walking that thin wire. I mean, don't get it twisted. I do some dirt too, but I ain't never put my gun on nobody who wasn't in the game. A man must have a code. Oh, no doubt. Surviving in this system, the one thing that keeps a person's soul intact and keeps him on the right side of that wire is his code. Throughout the seasons, we see different subgroups and characters embody various codes, consisting of philosophies, values, and rules to live by. So in this Screen Prism series looking back at the wire, we're going to speak about individual characters and how the codes that they adopt interact with the game, for better or for worse. And we're going to start where the show starts, with Jimmy McNulty and the code of being good police. Beware, there will be spoilers for all five seasons of The Wire. <laughs> because brother, when you were good, you were the best we had. The first character The Wire focuses on is Jimmy McNulty, who's pretty much wrong in every way. He's a drunk, a hound, he uses people, and he never says a polite word in his life. Save some for the rest of the customers, okay Jimmy? Pour it! But he has one saving grace, and that's that he's good police. Things that make me right for this job, Maybe they're the same things that make me wrong for everything else. He's not necessarily the best police we meet in terms of talent. Lester Freeman is far better than Jimmy when it comes to the brains of cracking a code and monitoring a wire. Kima Greggs and Bunk Moreland are more consistent, Cedric Daniels works more effectively in the system, and Buddy Colvin and his protege Ellis Carver, whom we'll talk about later in another video, show a stronger understanding of police as a community force and try to disrupt the system on a deeper level. Still, what makes Jimmy effective and what makes him the first focus on the show is his unstoppable will. West Baltimore is dying and you empty suits are running around trying to pin some politician's pelt to the wall. He is the impetus behind the two major wiretaps that bookend the series. The first wire on Avon Barksdale's operation that shows the department what really good police work can accomplish and leads to the on-again, off-again existence of a major crimes unit. And the final wire of the fake serial killer that Jimmy invents in season 5 in order to let Lester track the real serial killer that none of the bosses seem to care about, Marlo Stanfield. We got Marlo Stanfield. What about the serial killer? Marlo is he. In both cases, Jimmy pushes and pushes until his case has the support it needs, undeterred by what might stop other more polite, considerate, or loyal people. He learned no lessons. He acknowledged no mistakes. He was as stubborn a mick as ever stumbled out of the Northeast parishes to take a patrolman's shield. This devil-may-care drive that's Jimmy's superpower and his undoing is embodied in his catchphrases. The smirking, What the fuck did I do? What the fuck did I do? What the fuck did I do? Embodies his choice to be gleefully oblivious to how much he's inconveniencing others, messing up their careers, or hurting them personally. What the fuck did I do? You can't shut your mouth! He takes painfully honest to a grotesque extreme. A good example of a scene that draws out our conflicting feelings about McNulty is in season three when he makes D'Angelo's mother, Avon's sister, cry. Honestly? I was looking for somebody who cared about the kid. I mean, like I said, you were the one who made him take the years, right? We're torn because on one level, what kind of person could say this to a mother? And on the other level, we've been thinking the exact same things. And so has she. The beauty of McNulty is that there's nothing he won't say, no feeling he won't hurt, no person or rule he won't turn on in chasing what he thinks is right for the case. But I felt like we could critique the drug war effectively if we acknowledged that the police are supposed to matter they're supposed to solve crimes. We thought we got that right, the idea of this matters. Like, you know, this, I, I signed on, I made it all the way to homicide. We're not, we're, we're supposed to win. We're not supposed to lose. You do not make it easy, Jimmy. I have to admit, I am deeply ambivalent. Jimmy's other catchphrase is, He's a boss, fuck the bosses. In his mind, it's good police versus the bosses, and it's quickly established that one must choose in this system between climbing the ladder and doing real police work. There's no character in the police department who doesn't eventually have to make this choice. In police vocabulary, the choice comes down to whether or not to buy into the long-standing practice of juking the stats, which over time we learn is a common practice in the schools, politics, and every other institution in Baltimore. Juking the stats. Excuse me? making robberies into larcenies, making rapes disappear. 
You juke the stats and majors become colonels. It's the easy out of not doing one's job but getting credit for it, which ultimately makes everything worse for the citizens of Baltimore. Right. Despite his you early ambition, you. Daniels comes to realize that he'd rather be good police than get the glory. But the stat games, that lie, it's what ruined this department. Shining up shit and calling it gold so mages become colonels and mayors become governors. While we briefly hope during the supposed new day that the new mayor Carcetti falsely promises that these things can go hand in hand, in reality, the latter or juking the staff and good police work are constantly in direct conflict with each other. This culminates in Daniel's decision at the end of season five to turn down the job of police commissioner and retire from the force. The tree that doesn't bend breaks, Cedric been too far you're already broken and from what from the bunk just working a file business as usual and some of our other favorite characters also offer more healthy versions of the good police code than jimmy represents lester embodies patient intelligence and level-headedness lester is not only pretty much the best police ever but he's also the moral center of this code did he do that thing where he uh, stares at you over the top of his reading glasses you know what that look that says I'm the father you never had, and I don't want to be disappointed in you ever again. Always reminding others of the right thing to do for the case, no matter the political consequences. The Rawls came to me, asked if I would take the homicides. You should. Those girls in the can really suffocated, Lieutenant. They really died in that fucking box. Kima and Bunk are two other strong examples of good police. Kima becomes more and more like McNulty over time. Finding her aptitude for police work also makes domesticity challenging, not unlike a classic Western hero who prides himself on protecting society from danger but can't himself live inside that society he protects. But as police, she and Bunk are smart and steady. They recognize that progress, especially for a murder police, comes through returning and returning to the problem and being ready for insight to strike. All of these characters struggle and might need a taste now and then. Let's get a taste, I'm buying. To diffuse the frustration of trying to be good police in a system that discourages it. But Jimmy's passion for police work is presented as a true addiction. One that closely aligns with his much more obvious, at least at first, addictions to womanizing and alcohol. His police addiction is revealed more subtly, in moments when he takes a risk he shouldn't, like teaching his young boys to follow known drug dealer Stringer Bell. Elena, why are we here? Because you can't, you can't have Sean and Michael around criminals. You can't lose them in a Baltimore market. That's why. He wasn't a criminal. And Jimmy's sense of purpose in being good police sometimes gives way to an arrogant self-importance. There's not many. We're good at this, Lester. In this town, we're as good as it gets. His driving need in seasons one to three is to take down Stringer Bell. So his reaction to Stringer's death is telling. I caught him, Monk. On the wire, I caught him. He doesn't fucking know it. It's not just about stopping the bad guy. It's about making sure he knows that Jimmy beat him. Nicely done. Tell me something, Jimmy. How exactly do you think it all ends? What do you mean? A parade? Golden watch. Lester, with his experiences getting shut doing, away in the department for being real police. How long have you been in the pawn shop unit? 13 years and four months. 13 years? And four months. Tell me about it, Mr. 13 years. And four months. Knows better than anyone that there's no glory at the end of the job. The job has to satisfy in itself. And he is likely employed in a bureaucratic entity, possibly civil service or quasi-public service, from which he feels alienated. He has Jimmy comes to realize that his unhealthy behaviors are connected to his desire for winning a big case, combined with his frustration at the way the bosses and the system continually thwart his ability to simply work a case as it should be done. He steps in and out of the major detective work over the seasons, first because he's been forced to work Coast Guard duty as punishment, and later because he's trying to live a healthier life. And when he is policing, it's pretty much the same motherfucker, but on a good case. I mean, running in front of the pack. Finally, at the end of season four, he thinks he can keep himself from himself while being on a case. I think I can do this and keep myself away from myself. 
if that makes any sense. His phrasing screams of the addict who thinks he can have a sip without getting hooked again, and we know it won't go well. For McNulty, everything becomes expendable in the name of good police work. He uses this to justify his own bad behaviors, which really aren't necessary for the job. His desire to win and his willingness to destroy everything and everyone in his path ultimately isn't a stable, sustainable, productive way to live. Jimmy. In season 5, we see the culmination of McNulty's addiction in his willingness to fake murders to finally get the bosses to fall in line and unknowingly fund important detective work. An ideological split emerges between Lester and McNulty on the one hand, willing to bend the truth and the details for a bigger purpose. You fly this mess right, you can give it to me. Who gives a damn if we fake a couple of murders that we're never gonna solve, huh? And Greg's and Bunk on the other, who feel that violating the job in small ways becomes a slippery slope. Yeah. No shucking, no jiving, just good old police work. How about that, Jimmy? A lesson McNulty eventually comes to learn firsthand. What's me who told Daniels? I didn't want to do it behind your back, but uh, it had to be done. In the first season, The Wire is the symbol of good police work, what it can do and why it matters. When it comes back twisted in season 5 as an illegal wiretap on Marlowe that's supposed to be tapping the fake serial killer, the symbol of The Wire now challenges the rightness of breaking the rules of process in the name of a higher good, and forces us to ask whether Jimmy has now slipped onto the wrong side of his wire, or his own personal code, of being good police. Yet while Lester, McNulty, Greggs, Bunk, and Daniels diverge over the degree to which one should bend the rules or fuck the bosses, they share this core belief in being good police, a refusal to juke the stats, and a deep respect for each other. Detective, if you think you need to do it, I guess it did. Just like Bubbles, the heroin addict who's the heart of the series, McNulty manages to get clean in the end. On the night of his detective's wake for his retirement, Jimmy walks away, choosing not to have one final night of drinking. And the series ends with him staring out at the people of Baltimore, leaving it all behind. And together, Bubbles and McNulty's outcomes convey the seed of hope in the conclusion of the series. It's buried underneath the fact that the vast majority of the characters we've met and cared about are dead, in jail, or have completely sold out their ideals. But in Bubbles and McNulty, we get the sense that personal change is possible, that we can become better, and learn to live more productively with other people. For most who interact with the law and justice system of Baltimore, getting ahead means playing dirty, betraying one's own, killing, robbing, selling drugs, or doing a less good job, not being good citizens or good police. While nothing is black and white here, this is a show about morality, about collective responsibility, and how to be an okay human being in a world that gives us every incentive to stray from a moral path. According to David Simon, the show is really about the city as a true symbol of progress and how we might learn to live together. Um, the city to me is, is basically the only possible vehicle uh, that we have to measure human achievement at this point and, 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 to, and to pursue real human achievement, or I should say the paramount human achievement, which is how do we all live together? And how do we get a society that from one day to the next is actually progressing? Simon's intentions reveal another key meaning of the show's title, The Wire That Runs Through Us All. Because as much as we don't like to take responsibility for people in our society who are different from us, the truth is that we are all connected. We're building something here, detective. We're building it from scratch. All the pieces matter. We'll be talking about other Wire characters and codes in coming weeks, so please subscribe to our channel. 